So Peter, Peter Forbes, I should say your full name. First of all, a big congratulations. Thank you very you much. You've won the Warwick Prize for Literature with Dazzled and Deceived Mimicry and Camouflage. Thank you very much. Thank you for choosing it. Well, it's not just me, it's the rest of the panel. But um, I, I tell you where I'd like to begin. I think last time we met, you were editing Poetry Review, a fine magazine with a, a, a wonderful uh, lineage going all the way back to, uh, well, the founding of, I think, the uh, Poetry Bookshop with, um, yeah. with Mr. Munro and Poetry and Performance. And 1909. 1909. Yes. Yeah. That's wonderful. The we were very of aware of the tradition, but, um, yeah. but sometimes it was a bit of a millstone, that tradition. But that was 15 years ago, I think, when, when we were doing a poetry promotion, Poetry Books for Christmas. Yeah. You remember that one? Yes, indeed. Yeah. But my question is, when I opened this book, I thought, Dazzled and Deceived, Mimicry and Camouflage can't be the same, same Peter guy. Forbes. Right. So I flicked to the back, there he was, the guy with the beard, it's the same bloke. So tell me about this journey from <laughs> editing poetry, you were very good at it, and writing a book which I'll, for the moment, let's call a science book. Well, I started in science. I read chemistry for three years. By the end of it, well, not even by the end of it, it, this was the 60s, and what I really wanted to do was play guitar, but I got, in the 50s at school, science was the thing. You were channeled into science. I mean, I loved it for a while, but anyway, when I left university, I did a few lab jobs, but I knew I wanted to write, write, write. That was the thing. And it was a very long apprenticeship. I started writing a few poems, writing a few articles, and I started to get published a little bit. I mean, and, but to earn a living, I was working in scientific book publishing, uh, journals, that sort of thing. But I was working for a time on natural history reference books, and that's where I discovered mimicry. So, How do you mean you discovered it? Well, I mean, we were doing you know, books on everything you'd need to know about animals. So some of these creatures were mimetic creatures, and that's what fascinated me. So that's how I got interested in that, but that's a long time ago, 25 years ago. So how did I get into poetry? Well, I was writing poems while I was doing this kind of work. Um, one thing led to another. I uh, started to get published a bit more, and I got the job at Poetry Review. That was, that was the big thing. I was going to be a poet, and I was going to be the big editor. Andrew Motion was the editor before me, and uh, you know he became Poet Laureate. So, so I set on a poetry next. career. Yes. Oh, yeah. So I went from chemistry to, to poetry. And I was there quite a long time, but I was still had an interest in science, and I really had other things that beyond poetry I couldn't do. I left um, the magazine eight years ago, and I knew then I wanted to write these books. And uh, this is my second book, uh, a full-length non-fiction book. Um, I'm still passionate about poetry, but I mean you'll see bits of poetry in the book. But um, you know I'm not in the poetry business anymore, so I've hopped around from one thing to another. So. <sighs> How did you set about writing a book like this? Because I have to be honest, I was fairly dazzled. I wasn't deceived, but I was fairly dazzled. You are very um, cornucopic in your approach. You, you amass evidence. You burrow away into journals that, um, well, are probably pretty hard to find. I suppose they're much harder to find on the internet. Much e sorry, I should say much easier to find on the internet these well, days. Well, I honestly think that I couldn't have done this book or the one before without the internet. In 95, I discovered the World Wide Web. And if you're a researcher doing non-fiction, yeah. you start on the internet. For instance, if you want any scientific work, you Google the subject, you, you find the key scientists who are doing this work, you can email them, you can be talking to these guys within minutes. But what I really loved also was the archive work. I was a lot about the walls in here. Mm. So I went to the War Museum, the archives at Kew, burrowing through these 50, 60 year old files that hardly anybody's ever looked at. And well, the thing is, one thing led to another. When I started this subject, I had a very narrow idea of the sort of natural history of mimicry. But I knew that it, camouflage in the war was going to come in. Now, how did you know that? Let me, let me just stop you there, because oh. in a sense, you know, the book is, is a, a fine book about animals, about genetics and about evolution. That, that, it's a fine book on, on just on those grounds. But at some point or another, you made what is really a poetic leap. Yeah. You took the leap into a form of human behavior, if you like, which is to camouflage and, and our own form of mimetics and so on. So at what, what point was that? I, I sense that might have been a eureka moment. I don't know. 
Well, can I, I think the point is that when I first discovered these mimetic creatures back in the 80s when I was doing his natural history I was always passionately interested in art. I've always loved Picasso. I've always loved 20th century art modernism. And I guess I could see there were some parallels. I and mean, nature is an artist. I mean, people think... Oh, oh, now, wait a minute. Uh, no, you are very careful in this book, over and over again, to say that nature has no will of its own, no, yeah, no. that genetics and evolution has its own mechanisms, yeah. there is no outside body, it is not doing it through some will. So, wait a minute, I'm going to pull yeah, you up yeah. on your own count there. Yeah. But these patterns emerge yes. for whatever reason. Now, I discovered a long time ago, Sir Ernst Gombrich, a great art critic, um, he wrote about mimicry just a little bit in his art, criti art criticism. And he said that long before anybody set up an easel, nature had copied images. One creature had copied another unconsciously. And these patterns have often fascinated artists. They fascinated Picasso. He was interested in... You know, in the First World War, Picasso, in 1915, was walking down the boulevard. He saw his first camouflage tank, and Picasso was a great ego. Um, but he had some reason to say this. He said, that camouflage, we did that, that is cubism. Because if you look at a cubist paintings, he was painting five years before the war, he was painting five or ten, six years before the war, these cubist paintings that actually look like camouflage pictures. A, a human being doesn't look like a human being in a cubist picture. They've been cut up into all sorts of facets. So he said, they've copied us, the military, and there was something in it because when they formed the camouflage corps, France was the leader of the First World War. And they recruited a lot of painters. Some of them were Cubists. So it, the connection was there. Yes. And there are all these parallels between art and nature. Except that, of course, that the artist actually, you know, is consciously doing stuff and wanting to make pretty pictures. The butterfly's wings just happen to get that way through evolution. When I was a, when I was a child, very good popular science books by people like Lancelot Hogben. I don't know whether it's a name that rings a bell. Mathematics for the million. Exactly, yeah, mathematics yeah. for the million. But um, good as they were, they were not suspenseful. Somehow or other, um, a little bit of the, I don't know, the, perhaps the detective novelist Monquet in you decided right. to conceal and reveal, reveal and conceal, so that as we thought we had made one discovery, then you thwarted us and said, no, we've got to go there, and then you sent us back, and then you sent yeah. us forward. So um, I detect there something, something of the, um, perhaps even the novelist there as well, even as you're writing this very serious uh, account and recount of, um, of scientific yeah. uh, data. Well, I would hope so. I mean, some people do science. They do popular science by saying, these are the facts, and we're going to, aren't they wonderful, and they're all up front, and that's the way it is. But when I researched this, I kept finding scientists who disagreed passionately. And as decades went by, you know, explanations veered from one to the other and back again. Also, the human stories of scientists who were, you know, personally hostile, mm -hmm. and they state their cause, you know, that they had to believe in this, and any criticism was shot down. So actually finding the true course of this story, I mean, I only recorded what happened. There were all these shifts back and forth. Mm. Now, I got worried at times that perhaps I, I wanted a more straightforward story to tell, but you seem to like the twists and turns, and I hope people do. Well, and I wonder whether you have a hidden theory there that, in fact, one of the best ways to learn about science, I won't say it's the only, but one of the best ways to learn about science, particularly if you're not very good at science, is through strong narrative. I mean, there is a sense in which... Uh, science pretends it doesn't have a narrative, that yeah. it's, it's just amassing empirical evidence and coming up with hypotheses and proving and disproving them and then saying, look, that's reproducible, no, it isn't reproducible, and it's all very dry and dusty. Yeah. And then somebody like you comes along and comes up with these wonderful stories of discovery. And of course, as, you, as the scientist reveals it, as you reveal it, there's something also, of course, that is revealed inside our brains. Yes, well, unfortunately, the scientific paper, which is the way science is issued to the world, they have a protocol that you don't put anything personal in, you don't explain the twists and turns, you report the findings as an innovation in the literature. We have gone beyond what was done before. All of the story gets lost. If you take a story like this, discover the structure of DNA, it's a very simple structure in the end, the famous double helix. But the story, which is quite well known, is how they came to this. I mean, it's an astonishing story of errors, 
I mean, the, the story of Rosalind Franklin, the, um, the woman who almost got the structure but didn't and should have got a Nobel Prize, but she died and you can't award the Nobel Prize posthumously. The human stories in science are, are, are amazing. And it's very sad. It, I can understand why in the process of science that gets left out. But there's no reason why writers shouldn't come in and tell the stories. Now, let's come to the prize itself. So I think is unique in that it's not a prize for a given form, a given genre of writing. Uh, it's around a theme. As far as I know, very few, perhaps uh, this is the only one um, in this country at any rate. Um, how did you feel about that? Well, I mean, I know that Warwick's had a tradition of, of crossing the genres. It's had a creative writing program. It's famous for its translation work, post-colonial literature, and it's always had a lot of academics who have a high profile in the publishing world and the media. So it didn't surprise me that Warwick initiated this prize. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think there is, I mean, the science art divide is something that excites me and I want to try and close it. But there's also the academia divide between academia and the world of publishing journalism. And Warwick is at one university where you know, th this doesn't exist to the extent that it seems to do in, in, in other parts of academia. So, it, to me, the, the, I can see that the, the Warwick Prize for Writing is a logical extension of, you know, the activities like the writing programme over a long period. Some people watching this will be writers. There'll be people who want to write more. There might be young people at universities doing uh, masters and so on. Um, you've, you've been around the houses with this writing game. Just recapitulate a bit for us what it felt like when you thought you were no good and you weren't good enough. And how did you make yourself better? Yeah, it's, a, it's a really challenging question. The trouble is that it's a very, very competitive business. I mean, if you start out as I did, I, mean, I didn't, when I started writing, I, I, I was a brown envelope man, sent my poems out anonymously. You know, I didn't know anybody in the literature world and I assumed it was all sort of little Oxbridge circles and, you know, how do you get in? Um, but I did get published. But then, I guess for a long time, when I was trying to place a book with the publisher, I wondered if I was up to it. Um, I think the point is you have to trust that the feelings you get of the subjects you're interested in and you want to pursue, you have to trust that this is a genuine urge and that really all of the rest, all of the chances that happen, whether editors like you or not, you just have to shrug that off. I mean, there are writers who probably count their rejection slips. That's the wrong way. You forget your rejections and shrug them off and only concentrate on what's worked Obviously, you have to learn from your mistakes. I mean, actually, the physical act of writing, what I've learned a lot recently is that I used to be too satisfied. I'm a bit of a magpie. I mean, you know, this cornucopia stuff. I think sometimes I dash things off and wanted to move on to the next thing. I write more drafts now than ever. And, and I'm a sh I, I didn't think one time I'd ever write full-length books because I love a thousand words. I love the short run. I'm a sprinter because I love to move on to the next subject. To write a full-length book was a tough discipline, and I just had to keep writing, keep going to draft after draft after draft. Well, let me, let me just tackle you on that. What is this perseverance thing? Because you've described going to the internet, you've described going down to queue and finding the papers and so on. You've got to get up in the morning, you've got to get on a train, you've got to get into queue, you've got to deal with the bureaucracy of the tickets and oh, yeah. waiting for the files well, to that's come. that's okay. You I'm know, a... why not give up and just go and sit in a cafe and enjoy a, you know, a croissant or something? Well, so what's this perseverance thing? I'm just thinking that people come to me and they say, you know, I'd like to be a writer, I'd like to be a writer. And, and I inevitably say to them, you know, in a way I'm saying, how hard do you try? Mm. So. Where did that come from? Where did the, the, the little bug that got inside you had said, that gets you up in the morning and says, get on with it, Peter? Well, the research is delightful. I mean, getting on the train to get down to queue, going out, going out to meet people, going to Cambridge to meet the butterfly people or whatever, mm. getting on a train to go and research. I love that. But the harder thing is, the harder thing is you come back with a tape recorder and you've got to transcribe it and then you've got to then turn it into your mm. text and keep going. So what's well, motivating you? Well, to, to, to the love of the material and second, the need to earn a living. Right. I mean, you, you know, what else? You have to earn a living. And a bit of chocolate? <laughs> Piece of chocolate on the desk? Uh, no? no, well, uh, I'm, a, I'm a 
tea and coffee man, basically. Yeah, yeah it keeps me but down. It's that, yeah. it's that drive. But, um, anyway. But I guess I always wanted to do my own work. I never wanted to be a company man. I've always found... I used to love working in the Poetry Society, you know, with, in a sort of creative team and have office mm. life. But I'm happy researching on my own and writing. I, and I guess yet, I always wanted to do that. Now, this is a very social act. You've produced a book that is informing plenty of us who don't know this story and wouldn't have made the artistic scientific jumps that you've made, that you've, you've gone over a story that's familiar to some, not to others, all the rest of it. As I say, it's, it's, I don't want to make it sound boring, it's socially responsible. So there you are, there's a bit of an irony, isn't it? You're sitting there on your own with your tea and coffee and uh, slaving away, but then it's out there with a sense of social responsibility. Where does that come from? Well, um I think, you know, to be a writer is a great job, but you, you, often, you sometimes wonder. You, know, you look at people who are doing tougher jobs and the jobs that have to be done. I mean, nobody asks you to be a writer. And there are people out there saving people's lives and, you know, keeping your electricity going and growing your food and stuff. You've got to do something to earn your keep. And if you're, if you're a writer and you don't get your stuff out there and it doesn't, you know, get read, basically you have failed. I mean, you've got to justify your calling. And did you owe it to us in some way, telling us this story? I, at times I felt there was an urgency that, that you know, it's either irritated you or even angered you that people haven't got this evolution thing. They've, wow. they've, they've muddled it and they've distorted it. And there was sort of, you could turn over a page and there was a bit of Forbes being a little bit irritated and yeah. so on. And it was good, it was good irritation. There's an itch there because I suppose I feel that a lot of science these days, a lot of it doesn't get out. I'm, I, when I read the journals, the scientific journals, and it's f amazing stuff coming out all the time, um, and it gets into the newspapers, but I mean, I've seen articles actually in the newspapers that, of science where I thought this is going to set the world on fire, and it doesn't somehow. Yeah. And I think, God, well, we have to work harder, because science is full of fabulous stories. Yeah. And I mean, you know, and ultimately, it's about our survival. Ultimately. Well, it, yes, it is. Yes, and I, I suppose you know, you, you could butterflies. I mean, Bates. The story starts with Bates, the Amazon jungle in 1850. And people think butterflies, he said, airy, frivolous things, pretty, but what's the point? But the study of butterflies led to the cure for rhesus babies, mm. and butterfly research is the heart of evolution research, and eventually this is all going to be part of human evolution, where did we come from, and also medical benefits. It's all part of this great ongoing thing. And I, of course, I, I realised recently just... I mean, the scientific revolution is still quite new. Perhaps one reason why a lot of the message hasn't got out. It's going so fast and people need a lot of time to catch up. I mean, Darwin, it was but Darwin's big anniversary last year, 150 years since the origin of species, but a lot of people still struggling with it. Yeah. We need more time, it's so radical. Peter Forbes, thanks very much indeed for talking to me and talking to us. Um, and congratulations yet again. Thank you, Michael. Thank you.